drawing greetings with one another. So we're going through Lent here, and we've been studying the book of Jonah. And as we go through the book of Jonah, it's probably about time we address the elephant in the room, or as this case may be, a giant whale. You probably passed a giant whale out there. So the big question is, did Jonah really get swallowed by a big fish and then get spit out a few days later? That sometimes is the stumbling block to studying Jonah. Did a guy really get swallowed by a whale? If you believe he literally got swallowed by a giant fish, great. That's not the point of the story. What is so important, why is it so important that it literally happened? If you spend all our energy focusing on defending that, yes, this man got swallowed by a whale, we miss the whole truth of the story in our attempts just to defend a small piece of the plot. That's often in the case in history. We get so wrapped up in whether or not Jonah got swallowed by the whale, we do this to avoid the real message of the story, which is a lot harder. Now, if you don't think he was really swallowed by a fish, great. But why are you denying it? Sometimes we can go so far into scientific and rational worldview that we lose our sense of wonder. And when you lose your sense of wonder, it's very hard to follow a wonderful God who raises people from the dead and for whom all things are possible. So was he swallowed by a fish? Yes? No? I don't care. Let's wonder together why this story of a guy who ends up in the belly of a fish is being told in the first place and why it survived for thousands of years. That's why we're studying the book of Jonah, not to debate whether he was really swallowed by a fish, but why was this story told? Why was it considered so important to be put in this book we call the Bible that's a guide for our lives, that shows us who God is and how God works for our salvation? So we're now at chapter 2. Jonah has been swallowed by the fish after he's been tossed overboard in the midst of a giant storm. So this is what happens next. He's in the fish and it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and God answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the root of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. You see, storms and fish reveal things. They strip away the veneer, the false finish, and they reveal what truly lies beneath. Remember last week when the storm comes up, the sailors started throwing cargo overboard. Now, cargo was valuable. That's why you sailed the ship in the first place, to transport cargo. But in the midst of that storm, when their lives were on the line, they made the easy decision to throw overboard the cargo, the thing that, before the storm, was the most valuable thing they were carrying. At least they thought so. Storms sometimes tell us what's really valuable what's really important. There was a missionary, a Christian missionary in China. He was there spreading the gospel, and when some of the crackdown began of not allowing some of those Christian missionaries, and some Chinese authorities came to this man's apartment with his wife and his children. He said, you must leave the country in three hours. You can take 150 pounds of belongings with you. They had a full apartment. They immediately began getting their suitcases, trying to pick, well, do we take the photo albums? Do we take these books? Do we take the typewriter, the laptop? What should we take for only 150 pounds? They debated. They were, of course, arguments until finally they thought they had. They had all the suitcases filled. They weighed them 150 pounds. The authorities came back and said, are you ready to go? And they said, yes. Well, have you chosen your 150 pounds? 
And they said, yes, it was hard. We think we do. Then they asked, did you weigh the children? Suddenly, everything they thought was so important that they had fought over quickly thrown out of the suitcase. Laptops, photo albums, plaques and trophies. What they thought was the most important in a second became the least important. Storms have a way of revealing to us what's really important. Jonah shows his true colors in the midst of the storm. He sleeps. He doesn't pray with the sailors. He just says, just throw me overboard, guys. Let me go ahead and end my life in the deep. We see the depths of his depravity and the depths of his disobedience. He will do anything to get away from this God. There's a story in the Gospel of Mark that is fascinating in the similarities to Jonah's adventure on the boat. and It's in Mark 4, verses 35 through 40. Jesus and his disciples are on a boat crossing the Sea of Galilee when a huge storm comes up and starts rocking the boat, threatening to capsize it. Like Jonah, Jesus is asleep down below. And like Jonah, Jesus is awakened by his terrified companions. They say, teacher... Don't you care that we're about to drown here and die? Unlike Jonah, Jesus doesn't remain silent. He speaks up, and the sea becomes calm. He then rebukes the disciples. Guys, do you, do you still have no faith? Look at what the storm drags to the surface in this story. The storm reveals an anxiety and a doubt within the disciples about their own power to calm the waves that Jesus had earlier given them. He said, you can cast out these demons in the storm. But they didn't believe it. And it revealed anxiety and doubt about Christ's love for them. Don't, don't you care that we're going to die, Jesus? They had to ask that question. Have you ever had someone you loved ask you, don't you love me? Do you not even love me? Do you not even care when you deeply do? That hurts. Jonah knew that if he prayed, the sea would become calm, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. The storm reveals Jonah's heart. He doesn't even care enough to pray to save the others on the boat, and yet in the belly of the fish, he suddenly prays. According to writer Anne Lamott, there are three main types of prayer. There's thanksgiving. Thank you for this food. We know some people who don't have food to eat right now, and we do, so we're thankful. There are wow prayers. Where people praise God, God, you are amazing and gracious, and there is none like you, for you are holy and abounding in steadfast love. And then there are prayers we're probably all accustomed to when the storms of life come, we're clinging to the sides of the boat. Dear God, I've recently been ingested by a large marine mammal. Help! We do not generally pray help prayers all that articulately. It's really hard to gather your words and be articulate with all these fancy prayers when you're being ingested by a large fish. Or you're in the emergency room and you just watched your loved one be raced into an operating room. Or in the moments after the doctor gives you that grim diagnosis. Sometimes all we can manage is just help now. Perhaps you're familiar with the red and blue prayer. Do you know the red and blue prayer? You're driving your car and your eye catches red and blue in your rear view mirror flashing. <laughs> and you go, please, 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 please go be after somebody else. <laughs> and then when they race by you, your heart starts beating again. <laughs> and that's helpful to life. <clears throat> Have you been there? Help prayers are in the moment, full of emotion and adrenaline. Jonah is in a position where a help prayer would seem to be appropriate. He's been swallowed by a fish. If there was ever a time you might need help, it's after being swallowed by a giant fish. I haven't been in that situation, but I can imagine I would want some help. He was silent in the storm, but now prays in the tomb of the whale. Here's where it gets really interesting. Surprisingly, none of the words you just heard in Jonah's prayer are original to him. Instead, every single line out of Jonah 2 
is borrowed from one of the Psalms. He's praying the Psalm. He quotes eight different Psalms in his prayer. That's not all that odd, though. For as long as the Psalms have been around, people of faith have used them to learn how to pray. And it's simple enough to understand why. There are moments in our lives when we simply don't know what to say to God. Moments when we're so angry, confused, or so flat out uninspired that we can't choke out even the simplest prayer. In such moments, the Psalms become words of life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. See, there are basically two kinds of psalms. There are psalms of lament, basically help psalms, and there are psalms of thanksgiving or praise. Everything about Jonah's situation points to lament. He's angry. He's on the verge of death. He has digestive juices of a fish encircling him. But when Jonah prays out of the psalms, every single psalm he quotes is not a psalm of lament. It's a psalm of thanksgiving. It's kind of an odd choice. You've been swallowed by a fish. You would think that would be the time to raise up your complaint and your lament. But he chooses thanksgiving. We would think he would be praying help because our assumption is Jonah needs to be rescued from the fish. We want to be rescued from storms and fish, but storms and fish are often what rescue us. We think that once you're in the fish, you cry out from the depths to be rescued. But Jonah's response is, thank you. See, there are two wills in the beginning of Jonah's story, Jonah and God's. And those can't cohabitate in the story as equals. By the time we get to the fish, Jonah is someone who's been rescued from himself. It's no longer all about Jonah's smallness and pettiness and pride. He can't believe any of that inside the belly of a fish. Those things die in the belly of a fish, and they're buried in that tomb. We want to be rescued from the storms, but sometimes storms rescue us. Sometimes the storms reveal much-needed truth, and sometimes fish swallow up the parts of ourselves that we need to be freed from. Our pettiness, our selfishness, our smallness, and our pride. This Lent season, do you find yourself in a storm? Swallowed by a fish, desperately trying to get out of whatever the situation may be. Perhaps it's financial. Perhaps it's health-related. Perhaps it's relational. Perhaps you see the, the things happening in our communities around us. There's fear. Are you desperately trying to get out of the storm? Perhaps the lesson is not, help God get me out of this, but maybe it's, God, I'm in this. What am I being rescued from? In high school, I was drowning in the depths of my own cynicism. I thought I didn't need anyone. I could go at life on my own. I thought I was just fine. I didn't know I was drowning until the storm came. My parents were splitting up and my world was shaken. And I was just like, just just throw me over. Why does it all matter? What's the point of it all? But during that storm, new people came into my life who taught me about faith, hope, and love. They brought me into joy even in the midst of a storm. So that for the first time in my life, I was truly giving thanks to God. And what should have been the worst storm of my life, I was finding myself thanking God. Why? My world was falling apart. My family was breaking apart. The storm was all around me. And yet the storm was burying my cynicism. It was burying my independence. It was burying my pride. The storm was revealing the joy in life that had been buried underneath the layers of cynicism for far too long, washing away those layers of silt that only water and storm and wind can. And that joy found its way back up to the surface in the midst of the storm. When I prayed, I found myself giving thanks to God, really giving thanks for the first time. Jonah's in the belly of the fish and he gives thanks. He reaches into the rich history of prayer and prays words of hope and trust. See, prayer helps us live out and live into truths that we sometimes don't feel or can't see. 
Sometimes it doesn't feel like God is with us. Sometimes it doesn't feel like everything's going to be okay. Sometimes it just feels dark and bad. But feeling doesn't always mean the truth. Sometimes prayer helps us see that, that the truth, that despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, that God is in control. God can be trusted. God hears the prayers that rise up to God out of the depths. They come up before God's face, and God is concerned. Just like the prayers of the people of Nineveh, which God talks about in the very first verse of the book. So here we are about halfway through Lent. The wind is picking up, the rain is beginning to fall, it's, it's getting darker, ever darker, for we see the shadow of the cross ahead of us, leading us to Calvary. Christ endured a storm that Friday that we call good, mocked, beaten, crucified, and left to die before being swallowed by the earth for three days. He, too, reached into the rich history of the Psalms to pray to God. He found Psalm 22. He only said the first line, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But back then, you can say just one line of a psalm, and everyone knew exactly what you meant. The whole psalm came into mind. Early when I said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Did you think that was all there was to it? Or did you automatically know he means something more? about green pastures and still waters, an overflowing cup, and dwelling in the house of the Lord my whole life long. See, Psalm 22 starts in lament, but it ends in thanksgiving. It ends in the truth that God is in control, that God can be trusted, that God hears the prayers of those that rise up to God out of the depths. They come before God's face, and God is concerned. We call the Friday Christ was crucified good because of those truths and because of the truth proclaimed here in Jonah that storms can save. The storm of the cross revealed the depths of God's love. The storm revealed the truth that nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even sin, not even death. I'm thankful for that saving storm. I'm thankful the storm isn't the last word in Jonah's story. And it wasn't the last word for Christ's story. And therefore our story, like Jonah, like Christ, doesn't end when we are swallowed by the storm or the fish and the earth because the storm blew the stone away from Christ's tomb. It blows the stone away from your tomb. Saving storms. The wind comes. The rain beats down. What's being revealed? What will you find underneath? What might you be saved from? How is God working in that storm to produce thanksgiving? That's what Lent's all about, if you think about it. We're in the midst of the storm. We're following Jesus to the cross. But isn't that where we give thanks to God? for the cross, and for the resurrection. We wouldn't be here without that storm, the storm that saved all of us, the storm that saved you, the storm that saved me, saving storms. Let us pray together.